I will never ask for money. I am not into e-begging, but if you want to support me and my content, you can. I have a Patreon, and I also have channel memberships activated. If you want to support my content, click the button and choose the plan that's right for you. Or if you do not like YouTube's ways of doing things, but still wish to support me, click the link in the description for my Patreon. Then pick a tier that is right for you. Everyone who supports my content will get a shout out at the beginning of each video, as well as other perks like early access to content. Now onto the video. Two different men, from different cities and different backgrounds. But what they have in common is both were teenagers when their worlds were changed forever. Both were accused of murder. Both were tried and convicted, but both were innocent. For Ricky Jackson, his fight for freedom and to clear his name was 39 years. For Daniel Villegas, it was 25 years. Both held on to the hope that one day they would be able to walk out of prison free, with their names cleared of any wrongdoing. This is Ricky Jackson. For 39 years, he had been locked away in prison for a crime he didn't commit. As he sits waiting for the judge to speak, he is calm and collected. Because for 39 years, he had been waiting for this day. On May 19, 1975, Harold Franks was at a store on the east side of Cleveland. Franks was a businessman and a salesman. His product, selling money orders to local businesses. After doing his business, he left the store on Fairhill Road, walking right into a robbery. Two African-American men walked up to him and demanded his briefcase. He refused to give the briefcase to these men. One of the men threw acid in his face and beat him with a lead pipe. The other shot him twice in the chest with a 38 caliber handgun. That man also shot a window from the store, striking the owner's wife. 58-year-old Ann Robinson was hit in the neck, but she lived. The two robbers took the briefcase and left the scene, getting into a green car and speeding away with $425. Harold Franks died on the scene. The police that worked the case seemed to get a lucky break when they found a witness. A 12-year-old boy named Eddie Vernon claimed to have witnessed the event, and he would point the finger at three men. Eddie was brought into the station for questioning on what he saw. He claimed that 18-year-old Ricky Jackson was the gunman, along with 17-year-old Ronnie Bridgman. He claimed that the driver of the green car was Wiley Bridgman, Ronnie's 20-year-old brother. All three were locals, but Eddie was telling lies. He had not seen anything at all. His telling of events was inconsistent with the crime and other witness testimonies. Eddie claimed that he was getting off the bus when Ricky Jackson and Ronnie Bridgman walked up to Harold Franks. According to his account, Ricky and Ronnie confronted Harold Franks as Harold was getting out of his car. Remember, Franks was coming out of the store when he was attacked. This was backed up by Ann Robinson and a local 16-year-old girl. The 16-year-old girl claimed that she had walked into the store just before the attack and she saw two men outside the door. They were not Ricky and Ronnie. Eddie's own classmates claimed that Eddie was on the bus with them, and they heard the gunshots but couldn't see anything. Eddie tried to recant. Just before the lineup where he was to pick out Ricky Jackson as the killer, he told police that he lied. But the police pressured him into keeping with his story. The police and the DA would ignore the two testimonies that would prove Ricky, Ronnie, and Wiley were innocent. Each were tried separately for the crimes they didn't commit. There was no evidence of them being there. Just the word of a 12-year-old boy. At all three trials, Eddie Vernon's story changed again. This time he had already gotten off the bus when he witnessed the attack. On August 12, 1975, Wiley Bridgman was sentenced to death. On August 13, 1975, Ricky Jackson was sentenced to death. And on September 27, 1975, Ronnie Bridgman was also sentenced to death. All three men were able to get their sentences commuted to life in prison. For Ronnie and Wiley, 
they have the possibility of parole. But Ricky Jackson, the one that was considered the gunman, did not. In 2002, Wiley Bridgman had been granted parole, but he found life outside of prison hard. For weeks, he lived in a shelter and tried to pull himself up and make do with what he had. But he recognized a security guard at the shelter. He knew the man well, because it was Eddie Vernon. He confronted Eddie about what he did, yelling at him and screaming. Vernon's supervisor would later ask what was going on, where Eddie Vernon would tell him that he was a witness who testified against Wiley Bridgman. The supervisor told Eddie to contact Wiley's parole officer and inform him. Wiley would violate his parole and go back to prison. Ronnie was released in January of 2003. He had an easier time than his brother. Ronnie had educated himself in prison, so when he was a free man, he landed an office job. In 2004, he got married and changed his name to Kwame Ajamu. In 2011, Kyle Swenson, a reporter for a magazine called Cleveland Scene, published a detailed look at the case, showing the inconsistencies of the testimony by Eddie Vernon. Along with that, he also gave a motive for why Vernon lied on the stand. Ann Robinson's husband had paid the then 12-year-old Eddie Vernon $50 to testify against the three men. Swenson attempted to interview Eddie Vernon, but Eddie wouldn't talk about the case. Swenson became desperate to talk to Eddie, trying to go through Eddie's pastor to get Eddie to talk to him, but Eddie brushed it aside. Months later, after Swenson published the article, he sent a copy to the pastor. The pastor attempted to talk to Eddie about it, only to be brushed off. In 2013, the pastor tried one more time, visiting Eddie in the hospital, where Eddie was being treated for problems with his blood pressure. Maybe Eddie thought he was going to die. Maybe he thought the stress from keeping the secret was too much to handle. Whatever the reason was, Eddie confessed to his pastor that he lied on the stand, and the pastor would sign a sworn affidavit of this. The Innocence Project was made aware of this. Lawyers Brian Howe and Mark Godsey filed a petition for a new trial for the three. It was through the investigation these two lawyers did that it came to light that Eddie had been pressured to testify, not just by Ann Robinson's husband, but the police also pressured him, even after he had told the police that he lied. And the police hid Eddie's attempt to recant from the defense counsels of all three men. If Eddie Vernon hadn't testified, Two other men, Paul Gardenshire and Ishmael Hickson, were considered prime suspects. The license plate of the green car was matched to one belonging to Hickson. Hickson had a rap sheet. He had pled guilty in 1976 to armed robbery. So in November of 2014, Ricky's days behind bars were coming to an end. In November of 2014, Judge Richard McMonagall held a hearing on Jackson's motion for a new trial. Eddie Vernon was called to the stand once more, where he shed light into the ordeal he had to live with since 1975. He hadn't seen anything. He had been on the bus. The police fed him details. The police had used a child to put away three innocent men. Eddie Vernon had heard a rumor on the street, and he thought he was doing the right thing by telling the police about it. But the police began to feed him line after line, and when he wanted to recant, he was pressured into keeping the story. On November 18, 2014, Cuyahoga County Prosecutor Timothy McGinty stated that the state was not going to contest the motion for a new trial. The new trial wouldn't come. The prosecution dismissed his charges on November 21st, 2014. This is the moment that Jackson hears the words he had been waiting for for 39 years. Beth, do you have to say anything? Thank you, Your Honor. I'm the state of Ohio to but uh, Mr. McGinty uh, said the other day the state of Ohio at this time I make a motion to uh, dismiss the case. Mr. Jackson, you're going to be free to go. Life is filled with uh, small victories, and this is a big one. I wish you good luck. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'd like to thank you for conducting these proceedings in a fair and impartial manner. And I also would like to thank the prosecutor's office for showing a lot of integrity. When you guys let the evidence be heard and follow the evidence, and I would like to thank you. You know, you might not know it, but the probation officer who interviewed you after the verdict before was Mr. McGinney, who was the prosecutor who just uh, dismissed the case against you. So, like that's its twist. But uh, everybody did a good job here. I'm proud of everybody. Thank you. That's all. He looks up to the sky, happy that his ordeal is over. And as he leaves the courthouse, he is overwhelmed with emotion. For the first time in 39 years, he was free. I'm not going into how much he got from the state of Ohio when he sued them. It was a lot. I will just say that he has forgiven Eddie Vernon for what Eddie did. Finally. Come here, man. <laughs> Forgive the man who put him behind bars. <sighs> I took a lot of courage to do what you did, man. Thank you, man. It's sorry, brother. Just, we were both victims, man. It's all right, okay? I do forgive you, man. I wanted to be here personally to tell you that. Man. Wow. 
I didn't always feel this way about Edward. For a lot of years, I really hated him, you know, for what he did to us. Mistakes were made, man, you know. But I knew I had to do this because I desperately want to move forward with my life. And the only way I can do that is to forgive him. As for the Bridgman brothers, they were acquitted as well. Sadly though, Wiley Bridgman passed away in June of 2021. This is Daniel Biegas. For the last 25 years, he had been put on trial three times. This is the last trial. The one that would either allow him to walk away a free man or go back to prison for life. He cannot keep his emotions in. He has something to fight for. And that is two young children and a wife. Before I begin this tale, I have a confession to make. This is the one case that made me launch this series because of his reaction that you will see in full at the end of this tale. This tale takes us to El Paso, Texas. Daniel Villegas was a normal kid. While he did live in a more bad part of El Paso, he really wasn't a bad kid. Mostly had issues sitting still and paying attention in school as he had ADHD. In fact, he had dropped out in seventh grade and only had a third grade rating level. He was a little bit goofy and had a habit of telling tall tales, but his tales tended to glamorize the life of a gang member yet he himself wasn't in a gang, though he did hang out with some known gang members. It is important to also note that he did not have a criminal record. The most he ever been in trouble with was a curfew violation. To sum Daniel up, he was a kid who liked to make himself seem more important than what he really was at the time. He bragged, exaggerated, and flat out lied about his lifestyle. It was one of those tales that would lead him down a path that would see him crying in a courtroom. April 10th, 1993, Good Friday. Four boys, Jesse Hernandez, Juan Medina, Armando Lazo, and Robert England were walking home from a party. They stopped at an intersection when a maroon car pulled up to them. The passenger stuck his arm out the window, and the sound of gunfire fills the air. Six shots in total. Medina and Hernandez ran for their lives, but England had been shot in the head and died on the scene. Lazo was shot in the stomach and thigh, and he made it 50 yards before collapsing on a front lawn. He would die later from his injuries. Shell casings from a 22 caliber her handgun were left on the street. When the words were, were, were uh, yelled out from the car, I don't know right. if I can say them in the court, but they, it was a Spanish uh, saying, they, they just said, que putos, that's what they said. That's, that's all it was, uh, I remember, was, was que putos. And, and that's clearly not friendly, no. right? I just stood in like, oh, what the heck is gonna happen right now? And uh, I, I remember Mondo and Bobby say what? Uh, so he, they said what and then all I remember who's saying was your mama that's all he said was your mama who said that that was that was Bobby okay when when Ma Bobby said your mama he started to approach the car and I'm not I'm not saying he probably took about maybe three four steps and then shots were fired I remember a glowing light and I hear a ping like if it one hit the fence one had just passed by me and I heard it ricochet off the, the chain no off the fence okay by then I turn around I see a spark. That spark comes a gunshot, and uh, several right right after right after that one. I just say run. I just ran as fast as I could. That was the only evidence the police had to go off of. Detective Alfonso Marquez was put in charge of the case. And if you really need a hint how bad of a cop he was, well, here's a little hint. He brought Hernandez in for questioning, and uh, they put me into a. They put me into a, um, a cop car, and they said, we're going to take you downtown for questioning. We're, we're going to, I need a statement from you. Okay. And that's when I ended up downtown. For some reason, Marquez thought that Hernandez killed his friends. Because I can remember there was a, a window, but it looked like a mirror, and a, and a table with, with a couple of chairs. He took you in an interrogation room? Yes, sir. Accused you of killing those boys? Yes, sir. Were you scared? I was scared and I confused at the same time. Did you tell him that you didn't do it? I said, how could you say that? I said, how could you say that, sir? And he says, hmm. he says, your friend Juan seeing you did it. You have every motive to do it. You have, you have Bobby's ring. You have his beeper. For all we know, you even wanted his girlfriend and you wanted him dead. And I, I just, I just couldn't fathom that he would say that, or even Juan would say that. And um, 
He said, well, you know what? You're going to have to explain it to the church because they're going to fry us. And um, he walked out, and I just put my head down, and I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I was already thinking, how did I do it? I was already imagining <laughs> that I did it. But then I said, how did I get the gun? Where did I get the gun? And uh, I just kind of like, um, I was not there in the moment anymore. How old were you, Jesse? I was 17. Did you come close to confessing? If he pushed a little longer, yeah. When Hernandez tried to tell him the events of what happened, Marquez got angry. He lied and told Hernandez that Medina had already told police that Hernandez was the shooter, threatening to throw Hernandez in prison and making sure that he would get R-worded there. Hernandez was close to making a false confession. Marquez intimidated him to the point that he was starting to think Marquez was right. But he didn't, and he was let free. He gave me, a, when everything started, he gave me a notepad and he says, I need you to give me detail, word for word, exactly what had happened. And I wrote it on, on a legal notepad, a yellow legal, legal notepad. And he grabs it and he starts reading it. And he tosses it at me. He says, let's cut the bullshit. You know it and I know it, you're lying. So why don't you just confess and say you did it? It's because your friend's saying you did it. For, for my friend Juan to say that, I was like, why would he say that? What was, the, what was his motive? What was the reason for him to say that? He has to be true. Did you shoot your friends, Jesse? No, no, sir. No. Three days after trying to point the finger at Hernandez, Marquez brought in 15-year-old Michael Johnston. Johnston was handcuffed to a chair. He was interrogated for eight hours, with no lawyer present, by the way. Marquez threatened him, telling Johnston that if he didn't confess, Johnston would get the death penalty. Also lying to Johnston, telling him that his friends ratted him out. Johnston ended up confessing, but was never charged, because Marquez knew the confession was false. David Rangel was next, and he was given the same treatment the other teens received. But Rangel did something different than the others. While he was lied to in the same fashion as the other two, and threatened with bodily harm, he remembered a story that his cousin told him over the phone. His cousin had a habit of telling tall tales, and he told Rangel that he had been the one to kill England and Lazo with a sawed-off shotgun. When I mentioned the shotgun several times to Marcus, Marcus didn't like that answer. So he kept yelling at me, saying, no, that's not correct. That's not correct. So I didn't know what he needed and what he wanted for me to say. Rangel knew his cousin was just telling a story, but he told Marquez of his cousin and Rangel was let go. Marquez picked up Rangel's cousin, 16-year-old Daniel Viegas. Viegas was handcuffed to a chair, where Marquez threatened to drive him into the desert and beat him up. Viegas was threatened with the same things the others were, and he was terrified out of his mind. He agreed to sign a statement. But, when Daniel stated that 15-year-old Rodney Williams was the shooter and Daniel was the driver, Marquez slapped him and told him he was wrong and that if he didn't get it right, he would die in the electric chair. Before I continue, I have to rewind a bit. Rodney Williams was also interrogated by Marquez and suffered the same terror. He was 15 and he stated that he, Daniel, and two other men drove around in a black sedan, stole beer, and ended up having words with the four victims. Williams stated that Daniel shot England first, then Lazo as he ran. Williams and the other two named would not be charged, so I left the other two names out because they were kids who were terrified by a bad cop. Forced to sign a confession, Daniel tried to recant it hours later, but it was too late. He was charged with murder. Marquez never bothered to check Daniel's alibi. According to Daniel, he was babysitting and watching the movie White Men Can't Jump when the murder happened. In December of 1994, Daniel's first trial began. There was no evidence linking him to the crime. The others who were supposed to be involved were not on trial. Rodney Williams had been let go for lack of evidence. The two others that Daniel named in his confession were not even looked at because one was in prison and the other was under house arrest and had an ankle monitor on. It came down to only 
only Daniel, which it shouldn't have. Daniel's confession should have been called into question due to the false and factually impossible details. Details like, oh, I don't know, the two individuals having airtight alibis thanks to the El Paso Police Department. Those who made statements stating Daniel was the shooter also recanted their statements, saying they were under pressure from Marquez. Daniel took the stand in his own defense, where he testified that when he was saying that he was the one who did it, he was joking around. He told of the harsh interrogation treatments he had been put through, and at the end of the first trial, 11 jurors found him guilty, but one didn't. So it was a hung jury. So a retrial was called. His second trial began in August of 1995. In the time since then, Daniel had got a new lawyer, one from the public defender's office, and that public defender wasn't given much time to prepare. Thus, instead of calling the witness who stated that Daniel was innocent, he called one witness. Daniel was found guilty and was sentenced to life in prison on August 24th, 1995. John Mimbella was a successful contractor. Newly married, his wife had mentioned Daniel Villegas in the past, and Mimbella thought he was guilty at first, but his wife believed that he was innocent. Why? Because his wife was once married to Daniel's brother, and she held on to those close ties to the family. She suggested that he meet with Daniel and see for himself. Mimbella believed that the justice system only put away those who were guilty, but meeting Daniel in prison, that changed his mind. He knew walking away from that meeting that Daniel was innocent. He also read every Everything he could about the crime, articles, police reports, and it only affirmed his belief that Daniel was innocent, and he was going to do what he could to get Daniel out of prison. First, Mambella went to a DA, requesting the DA reopen the case, but he was shut down, but he didn't give up. He began spreading the word about Daniel's case by protesting and rallying, spending money to put billboards up, and he hired a private investigator to look into the claims. And the PI did something the police didn't bother doing. They went straight to Jesse Hernandez. Hernandez didn't want to talk about it at first, but then he slowly allowed the PI to talk to him. The PI gave Hernandez a copy of the confession, which Hernandez confirmed that the details in Daniel's confession were completely off. It was a maroon car, not a black sedan. It wasn't a shotgun, it was a 22 caliber handgun. Daniel, in his confession, claimed to have shot Lazo in the back as he was running away. Ballistics showed that the wounds sustained to the two victims came from in front of them. Hernandez knew the confession was false, and an innocent man was put behind bars. And when he told it was Marquez that was the one who interrogated Daniel, Hernandez's eyes grew wide. Hernandez was never called to testify also in the two trials, by the way. For all he knew up until that point, Daniel was the one who killed his friends. After Mimbella heard all of this, he hired the best lawyer he could find, a man named Joe Spencer. And in 2011, Spencer filed a writ of habeas corpus. Witnesses that were not called at the second trial were called. 33 witnesses who corroborated Daniel's alibi, experts on false confessions, and Jesse Hernandez all testified in favor of Daniel Villegas. At the hearing, Marquez also testified and he claimed that his treatment of the people he was interrogating was false. Which, let's face it, one person saying, it, it's a he said, she said moment. But multiple people saying it? Yeah, Marquez is lying under oath. Also, it turns out, if Marquez was good at his job, he would have gotten the information that the PI was able to find. Like how two gang members threatened Lazo's life a couple of days before, and then bragged about killing Lazo after. After hearing everything, the judge called for a retrial, and Daniel was granted release in 2011, where he would work for Mambella's construction company, and marry a woman who was friends with his sister. They would have two children together. The trial was coming, and Daniel was hoping for a good outcome. The prosecution, though, threw him a curveball in the form of offering him a way out. They offered him an Alfred plea. Probably has something to do with the fact the prosecution didn't want him to be found not guilty. And we have seen this before with the West Memphis Three. And Daniel thought about taking the deal. He didn't want to go through another trial. But there was one person who came to him to tell him that he could do it. To tell him that he was strong enough to make it through one more trial and come out the other side a better man. And to prove to the world that he was an innocent man. One who regretted taking the Alfred plea. A man I also already covered, Jason Baldwin. They were either bragging, they were just talking, uh, wanted to be tough, but they were, the detectives got information from five or six different individuals that all admitted to the shooting of Armando Lasso and Robert Inland. An individual, Robert England, by shooting Robert England with a firearm, and then there intentionally and knowingly caused the death of an individual, Armando Lasso, by shooting Armando Lazo with a firearm. 
He was not specific about the gun that was used. I have been asked if I know what kind of gun or weapon was used in the killing, and I don't know. That is contained in this in this statement. That's what Marcus put in. Okay, there. and you you're saying that this was the truth, what you were telling the detectives back then. Correct. Okay. But you're also telling them that he was joking, and you told the detective he was joking, and you told them that over and over again. Correct? Yes, but he didn't want to hear it. Detective Marcus pretty much told me that. You know, he didn't want to hear what I had to say in regards to that. He said it's not correct. He didn't like he didn't like the fact that the shotgun was in there. That was the that was the biggest out of all of it. That was the biggest one that he did not like in the statement. You're going to tell this story. There was no reaction. I couldn't say that if there was no reaction, but again, I'm telling you, our family's pretty tight, so we still we were still with each other after the fact. What was their reaction when they found out that you gave this information to the police department? I don't. I wasn't there. I don't know. I'm not saying that day. In the time that you progressed, you ask an answer and argumentative. Yes, an answer is October 5th, 2018. After going through trial once more, with more on the line than before, Daniel Villegas rose to hear the verdict, tears in his eyes, being held up by his attorneys, his wife and children waiting to hear if he was coming home or if he was going to be sent back to prison. Within a moment, he gets his answer. The court does find that the verdict is in proper form. If the defendant will please stand, In the District Court of El Paso County, Texas, 409th Judicial District, the State of Texas versus Daniel Villegas, number 940D09328. Verdict form B. We, the jury, find the defendant, Daniel Villegas, not guilty of... <laughs> falls, crying tears of joy. A 25-year nightmare has come to an end. The audience erupts with cheers around him. And today, he works with Mambella's construction company still. He has four kids, but things are still not easy for him. He has been told he cannot pick his kids up from school, and that's because of the false conviction. But he smiles and lives a good life, and he makes the most of what he has. There are some people out there that think the criminal justice system is flawless. That the police and the court system put only the wicked away. But that is not always the case. For all the cops who want to help people, there are bad ones looking to just make an easy conviction. For all the good lawyers out there, there are some who don't want to try as hard. That is the facts of life. The criminal justice system isn't perfect. I just ask you to keep an open mind. That guilt or innocence is not as cut and dry as it could look. There are some who will think that these two men are guilty and no matter what I say, they will still think that. And all I can say to them is to look into the case more. You might change your mind.